Okay, I've got seven o'clock. So we're going to start uh, right on time. I think we have around 65, 70 people here. We intend to start on time uh, every week, so you can plan on that. Uh, it's sure nice to be with you all. I'm, I really enjoy being with people who love the gospel and the new light that's coming at us at this time. It's so, I'm so saddened by people who just are indifferent or worse, uh, to the new light that God is shedding on the earth. So it's good to be with you. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about part one of the Denver's Holy Order talk. Uh, Matt and Sarah Lohmeyer will be our discussion leaders. And once we get through with a few uh, uh, announcements and an opening prayer, we'll turn the mic over to Matt and Sarah. During this presentation, you will be able to ask questions in the chat. And if there's time, uh, uh, Matt and Sarah will entertain those questions. Uh, if it's something very pertinent, Cameron, uh, who's in the background, uh, putting on this whole Zoom thing, will uh, read your comment and interrupt Matt and Sarah if he feels it. It needs they need to be interrupted. Uh, I see D Spicer. Are you willing to give us an opening prayer? I think that was a yes. Yeah, I need to unmute him. Give me one second. Okay. Okay. If you guys are ready. Thank you. Father in heaven, we're very thankful to be here for this uh, first installment of the series for uh, the first Holy Order talk and for what we can learn there. We're very appreciative of the opportunity we have to learn of the light that thou art restoring to the earth and for the fellowship we have with these people on this call. We're very thankful for the ability to move forward and to uh, get a next installment here this spring. And we pray that uh, our eyes will be opened, that the scales of unbelief will fall and that we will be prompted and learn from the Spirit. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. A couple of other housekeeping things. Um, these uh, talks will be, these discussions will be recorded, and within a day or so, they'll be posted on the uh, Restoration Archives site. Um, next week will be part two. Um, Alan Van Leer will lead a discussion on the Holy Order, which is uh, the next uh, sort of section of Denver's talk, where he kind of describes what the Holy Order is and what it isn't. Um, and I think that's enough announcements. Matt and Sarah, take it over. We will. <laughs> Thanks, McKay. I'm going to um, begin with a few preliminaries. And then I'll hand it over to Sarah, who's going to start us off in page one. And then I'll take back over uh, the reading of the text in page two. Uh, I'm not going to be looking, but I've texted McKay the link to uh, the talk. So, And I've asked him to post that in the chat because we're not going to share our screen and put the text on the screen. We're simply going to read from our a uh, copy here on the desk that has our notes in it. Uh, but up front, I thought I'd share, um, I guess, what we're trying to accomplish with our um, discussion. And, um, and then I guess what we'll do is go from there and see how it all turns out. Um, but it might be helpful for you to have a copy in front of you if you'd like yeah. that, just because we won't be putting the words up on the screen. Well, I didn't finish that thought. That's why we're both here together. <clears throat> Picking what I'd like to share first here. Um, I think it's important that Sarah and I try and contextualize 
this holy order talk uh and so i'll begin with a few thoughts and and then i'll turn it over to sarah um i'll say up front that and i and this shows up in the um in the talk i don't believe it's possible to progress in our understanding of priesthood unless we recontextualize the entire topic or unless we replaced our old worldview or paradigm of priesthood with a new one and so I'd like to propose the idea up front. It's my view that what Denver has done for us in teaching us both about priesthood back in the 10 talks and in the Holy Order talk and soon to be talks is try and essentially reestablish the paradigm uh, of what we call priesthood, what we term priesthood. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, I put it that way because um, it'll be apparent to you as we get into the text that what he doesn't try to do is work within the existing worldview or understanding of the LDS institutional church and just tweak definitions a little bit uh, pertaining to the priesthood. But instead, he dismisses outright certain concepts that we've held for a very long time as if they needed to be abolished altogether whatever granules of truth were in them. And then he reestablishes an entire overarching view of priesthood. He redefines priesthood in um, his, in the 10 talks. Uh, that was years before this Holy Order talk was given. And um, after, um, I won't get into the timing. You're going to get into that. Uh, so let me just share up front that in the first two pages of this talk, what we're intending to cover, and we'll probably be a bit repetitive here, is the topics of keys and dispensations and Adam on Diamond, which may at a glance appear to you to be somewhat disconnected, uh, even if we, th we think we've got an understanding of all of those terms. There's a reason why Denver addresses all of them up front in the first two pages of our introduction to the Holy Order. They're all related um, and we're going to go through them one by one, but they're all very connected. And I hope that that's apparent by the time we get through this first two pages. Because we have only two pages between the two of us that we have to cover, we think it would be rather a disservice to the group for us to skip and pick and choose from that text trying to cover it. And so our preferred approach is to actually read through that text with you on the call today. That's a that's a fortunate um uh, privilege, I suppose, that we've got only having this much material that other presenters over the next um, several weeks are not going to have. Uh, and so we're going to try and accomplish that line by line. And both of us might step on and interrupt one another occasionally if we feel inspired to make a comment about anything that we're reading. And of course, depending on the time it takes to do that, we will um, try and get into some questions in the end. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to share up front. I'll turn it over to Sarah. I just thought it would be uh, worth noting a little historical context note and point you to the date that this talk was given. Um, you'll note that it's a, in October of 2017. That's one month after the Covenant Conference that many of us participated in in September of 2017. And I wanted to read to you something that was said at that conference. The Lord determined long ago he would use a covenant to graft back people who had become wild and bitter and connect them to the original roots of the tree of life. Or in other words, restore a people in our day to his covenant. The covenant offered today in September of 2017 is from God and is the first step requ required to restore the family of God or tree of life on the earth. It will change the lost, wild, and bitter fruit and begin to recover them and turn their hearts to the fathers. This will connect those who are living today with the natural roots or the fathers who still hold rights under the original covenant. Um, the initial graft happens today, we were told. Um, and you can have images of... What was Jacob 5 now Now in our new scriptures is Jacob 3, but the grafting of different branches into this mother tree. And so God offered a covenant in September of 2017, 
And there were a people who accepted it. And that's been likened unto a wild branch that was grafted back into the mother tree. Um, and it's a month later that we get this talk, this treasure of a talk on the important topic of the priesthood and the holy order. And I think it's beautiful. I, some groundwork had been laid a few years earlier with the priesthood talk um, during the 10 talk lecture series. And I think that laid some important groundwork in us changing some of our beliefs and understandings about what priesthood is. And so then here a little, there a little, little pun, little precept by precept, we get to learn more and more. And I think it's beautiful to consider that God strengthens this newly grafted, tender, vulnerable branch that's just been grafted in. And he strengthens that by even one month later, um, starting to dispense more light and truth and knowledge about uh, the important topic of priesthood and the holy order. Um, we've been given a lot, and um, I'm grateful that we all get to study this together because I think that's one way that we can show gratitude for what we've been given. So just wanted to point that out, that the timing, I think, is important. And so with that, let's let's read together. Uh, this is Denver speaking. He says, I was asked to discuss the topic of priesthood. The biggest challenge in discussing the topic is that mo those most interested already have a context in their mind. And so whatever is said about priesthood is distorted by their misunderstandings. It becomes almost impossible to make any meaningful forward movement in understanding a much bigger picture. To make progress, this discussion should be looked at as introducing something very different from how you now understand priesthood. This is sort of what Matt was already talking about. Consider new ideas that may change the picture altogether. I will be using quotes from Joseph Can Smith. I, jump in? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I just want to make one more point about, about this. I don't assume that everyone on this call or who's presently a part of what we sometimes refer to as the movement um, is, is, how do I want to put it? I don't assume that they've been a part of the, that everyone's been a part of this journey for a decade. I don't assume everyone was around when the 10 talks were given. I assume that some of the people who might be listening to this either now or after the fact, maybe are fairly new to it as of the last couple of years, maybe even since this talk was given. And if that, if those people have come out of LDS Mormonism, let's say the Salt Lake City based LDS church, uh, it probably would be useful in my view, but that's just because it's how I came at an understanding of these topics to expose yourself thoroughly with Denver's 10 talks and understand his redefinition of priesthood in terms of fellowships um, and see what he does with the language that Joseph himself gave us at the beginning of the restoration and progress from there. If it's useful, then, then to the Holy Order talk. Uh, frankly, probably to the covenant, uh, that re baptism and the covenant, uh, like Sarah had mentioned, and then see if you can't make better sense of some of the ideas here. Because as Denver points out in this first paragraph, not only is this a much bigger picture, and that's for sure, um, it's a grand picture. It's a grand sweeping view of the relationship between gods and men. And um, he terms it holy order in this talk, Whereas in other instances, it might have previously been termed priesthood. And he seems to directly confront, it's probably the kindly way of putting it, the ideas that he says here were a part of an earlier context and they're a part of our misunderstanding. And so I would just encourage those of you who have not yet become familiar, if there are those of you here with uh, that priesthood talk, to probably go back and look at that and then come and revisit uh, some of these. I just wanted to jump in and yeah, share that. Thought. I'll continue in paragraph two for those who are reading along. I will be using quotes from Joseph Smith that frequently use the word keys. That word is horribly misunderstood. I have made it a practice not to use the word because of all of the foolish and vain ideas that have accumulated around it. Joseph used the term in a variety of ways. For example, to mean authority or opportunity, and in others, it refers to a correct idea. The term in the context of priesthood is completely absent from the Book of Mormon, 
and the book is the keystone of our religion, containing the fullness of the gospel. The only time the word keys is referenced in the Book of Mormon, it refers to a physical set of keys to unlock a door to the tre treasury controlled by Laban. Although Joseph used the term often and meant many things by it, the challenge is to understand priesthood without being distracted by a poorly defined and often used term. So uh, that's kind of a purpose statement there. Our challenge here is that we come from a context where we've learned a lot about keys and priesthood, and we need to now um, take a step back and try and unlearn some of that so that we can build on a, a better foundation. Do you have anything to add Yeah, here? and I'll restate, I guess, the last two sentences there. Uh, the challenge, and Sarah just made this point, and I'm going to restate it because I think it's that important. And we've talked about this. We've read this together several times and discussed it together. And this is one of those points that Sarah and I keep settling on as we tried ourselves to really make sense of all of the text. The challenge is to understand priesthood. He's asked to come and talk about priesthood. Um, the challenge for us here starting off is to understand priesthood. And what does he do? He attacks he confronts our misunderstandings about keys. It's really interesting because that term was so inextricably bound up in our understanding of what we thought priesthood was that he wants to disentangle that for us, uh, abolish our understanding of that term, at least in connection to priesthood, and then reestablish it in a proper context for us, which he will do all by the end of page two, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's good. The, he, we're, we're about to go and contrast two definitions. Uh, first is the definition of priesthood keys that was in the LDS handbook, um, which I think might be changed by now, but this was the this was the one at the time. <laughs> I'll, I will jump in to say it was, we had a friend that um, he, fought, he, fought, he read um, all of Denver's material since probably 2010 he started with the second comforter book a good friend of ours he read all of it until the last of the 10 talks and now he tangentially pays attention and he criticized this statement uh that, that sarah is about to read as unfair noting that the lds church handbook of instructions that is referenced in this footnote is out of date no longer in use and therefore, it was unfair to quote that definition of priesthood keys uh, because the church, et cetera, et cetera. Earlier today, uh, because I wondered if it might come up, I went to LDS.org just to um, type in priesthood keys. And it is so utterly close to what it is that Denver has quoted from the Church Handbook of Instructions that there is no material difference in understanding in 2024 than there was from this older church handbook of instructions from which Denver was quoting. So just and, thought I'd point that out. Yeah. Either way, this is the definition that we That's grew right. up and, and um, influenced the culture that we come from. So we're going to look at that definition and then we're going to contrast it with what the scriptures um, say, how priesthood ought to be used. So paragraph three, Mormon institutions now use the term most often to connote the term priesthood keys, most often to connote that there is an exclusive right, license, or control. The LDS Handbook of Instruction states the following, priesthood keys are the authority God has given to priesthood leaders to direct, control, and govern the use of his priesthood on earth. This definition is the opposite of the way scripture directs priesthood be used. And then we'll read from, you're familiar with the, what was DNC 121. In our new scriptures, it's TNC 139. We have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men. As soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Hence, many are called, but few are chosen. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood. Just because you hold a position isn't the reason that um, you get to control other people. Only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness and love, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile. 
Uh, and the, the commentary in the next the paragraph is the LDS handbook approach turns this scripture upside down and backwards. By virtue of priesthood keys, they have the right to direct, control, and exercise influence over other uh, over others. Mormon institutions in general all use their preferred meaning of the term keys to denounce anything or anyone they view as a rival. That is nonsense, and I avoid using the term because of the widespread abuse of practice. Um, so I, I thought I'd share just a quick um, story from when I was serving as an early morning seminary teacher, which I'll argue is one of the best callings in the church. Um, the stake president who was training us seminary teachers and teaching us about what our jobs would be, he said to us, um, because of my keys that I hold, you have the right to receive revelation for your seminary class and for how you teach your students. And um, be because I have keys and because I've called you with those keys to that position. So now you have the right to receive revelation for your class. And I'm not sharing this to bash the church or to criticize him individually, but more so to point out the, <laughs> the mindset of the culture that we came from uh, not that everyone believed that exact same way that he that he was teaching us, but that's that's the mindset and the culture that many of us came from. And so the the whole reason that this whole um, priesthood and holy order talk begins with you guys need to unlearn some things because there's been an uh, obsessive. Uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Obsessive. An, an obsession obsession yeah. with keys and you don't even understand what keys are so let's go back and unlearn some things so that we can break down that building that we built and start with a new foundation um it's like there's been a possession yeah the keys the priesthood keys possession yeah <clears throat> anyway that's that's why i share that story is this this idea that like you're not even to get revelation for your class unless um your priesthood leader has keys that shows that, yeah, we need to unlearn some things. Um, that definition, the contrast of uh, what the LDS handbook said versus what uh, the Doctrine and Covenant said, I think it's pretty instructive and changes our mind to why it's important that we need to be open and um, unlearn some things. We're going to transition into the second half, the page two of uh, tonight's discussion. And so we're halfway there in one sense, at least uh, materially. I don't know if we will be temporally, but we are um, on a good pace. Um, I suppose we should wait until the end to see what questions are coming in or comments, because if there are, um, maybe okay. we'll answer them anyhow by going through the material. Continuing on with page two, the greatest key... And by the way, I did, I did want to say about that last sentence on page one. That is nonsense, he says. And I avoid using the term because of widespread abusive practice. I want to, it's a finer point, but I want to make the point that he doesn't use, he doesn't avoid using the term because the term is bad or naughty or poison in and of itself. He says he avoids using the term because of widespread abusive practice. And now he does use the term keys. And keys are mentioned in scripture, and there are different meanings and definitions, as he's pointed out. And so he's about to get into what, in his view, is the greatest key. And so we ought to lay hold on that and, and work with that as an idea for um, understanding the entirety of the topic of keys, dispensations, and Adam and Ayaman that we will get into in this page. And, and so he defines that. He says the greatest key to unlock truth is, quote, pure knowledge which shall greatly enlarge the soul. This is how the brother of Jared was able to pierce the veil. And because of the knowledge of this man, he could not be kept from beholding within the veil. It was the pursuit of greater knowledge that led Abraham to find God. When God gives a man a dispensation from heaven. Okay, I'm pointing out here just for clarity's sake. Um, we've spent the first page, we spent time on the first page with keys nearly exclusively, 
but now is the um, introduction of this idea of dispensations. And this is a really meaty part of the first two pages. And so I'm just re-queuing your attention. Uh, and, and it's all going to tie together very nicely with, um, with what we've talked about with keys here. So there's a reason he wants to disabuse us of our misunderstandings of keys and then immediately go into dispensations because as you reestablish the proper framework for understanding priesthood and holy order, you necessarily begin at the beginning with the first man and the first woman and this idea of dispensations of the fullness of the gospel of Christ. When God gives a man a dispensation from heaven, there is a labor to be done in his vineyard. This, this vineyard is a really important theme. It comes up here. It comes up uh, in September, a month earlier, as Sarah pointed out. As soon as the covenant was established, Denver wanted to talk about the parable or the allegory of Zenos that Jacob gives us. It came up again in his recent understanding prophecy talk, which, as I understand, it seems to be a prelude to the coming Holy Order Part 2 talk. This is a theme that's occupying his mind in both understanding the fulfillment of prophecy <clears throat> and apparently even understanding the relationship of priesthood dispensations, keys, authority, and the winding up scene. They get a labor. When a man gets a dispensation, there is a labor to be done. The authority, emphasize footstomp this word here, the authority to complete the labor is implicit with the assignment that was given by God. And I think it's important enough that I want to restate it. The authority to complete the labor is implicit with the assignment given by God. If God asks you to do something, that's your authority. That's your, it's like, I've told you, what greater authority have you got to go do something? How foolish it would be then for the man to turn around and brag about his authority, his priesthood. Especially, as Denver pointed out, I think perhaps in the Second Comforter book and elsewhere, it really helps contextualize things. To stand in the presence of the Lord, to sense of his greatness and majesty and mercy and perfect love, and then to go bragging about yourself as utter foolishness. But that's what we we had become accustomed to. So someone gets authority from the, the Lord of heaven to accomplish a work, to speak in his name, that's that the assignment is the authority to complete the labor. But we're going to get back into keys and see how they play into all of this. When someone receives a dispensation, in this next sentence, and discharges the assignment with honor, he holds the keys, owns the rights, enjoys the honors, we've seen all of these words elsewhere before, and possesses the dispensation of that assignment to all eternity. This, I don't need to, I'm foot stomping it, but I don't need to reread it. It's going to come up again uh, before this page is over, okay? So hold that thought. Uh, by the way, I will give one example and to preempt the question, you know, do we have examples of this definitively in scripture? Of the idea that not only is a dispensation bestowed or granted upon a man, but then that dispensation is only retained, the keys there of the power there of the honors, by that man once they'd faithfully discharged their labor. I would point your attention to, we won't go there and read it tonight, section 140 of the Teachings and Commandments. That's at least one place where you can go to read Joseph Smith's explanation, its instructions, or I think he calls it an investigation of the priesthood that was dictated to his scribe, Robert B. Thompson, in October of 1840. And in that, uh, for time's sake, I won't go read it, but I will say that he he mentions, he start with Adam, he mentions Cain and Abel, both of whom were authorized to make sacrifice, both of whom came first, and, and um, he loses it, heirs to the birthright, and um, Abel acquires it, receives dispensation according to Joseph, and he's killed. And he goes out of the world a righteous man. And Joseph makes the point in section 140 that because he died righteous, he took with him the keys of his dispensation. So the same teaching 
is there from Joseph. This is not a new idea. It's just been clarified for us by Denver. Okay, we're four lines. We've, we finished four lines in that paragraph. A new dispensation is founded on another foot stomper. This is all critical, and every word is deliberately placed. A new dispensation is founded on knowledge. Go right back up to the top of this page. The greatest key to unlock truth is pure knowledge. And he's saying here that when a dispensation of the gospel is established in a man on the earth, that new dispensation is founded on knowledge from where? From those who went before who all declare their dispensation, their rights, their keys, because they still retain them, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood. There's, there's explicit purpose in the visitations and in the instruction, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, to the new dispensation. An unchanging God bestows an unchanging gospel. Therefore, there is continuity and understanding shared along the path. There's the purpose. Uh, it's the way in which, or the mechanism by which the Lord of heaven establishes a dispensation on the earth. And it's the, this is a way of demon, of explaining the necessity of the involvement of those since Adam who have come, held dispensations of the gospel, possessed keys, honored and faithfully discharged their obligations and gone to the next world. They show up to do something with the new dispensation. Therefore, there is continuity and understanding shared along the path. These servants, that is, all of those who show up, all of those who show up declaring their dispensations and their rights and their keys and so forth, these servants obtained rights and honors and are expected to come to the great future meeting in Adam on Diamond. I'm sorry, when Adam on Diamond occurs in the last days, and this is a footnote that I think we're going to go read. <clears throat> The footnote says that the phrase Adam on Diamond means Adam in the presence of son Amon. You've heard variations of that. Uh, here's our definitive definition for us. The first time this happened was near Spring Hill in Missouri. Since it was an event and the location acquired significance because of what happened there, I use the term to describe a future event rather than a fixed location. Latter-day Saints think the future event will take place at the same location as the first event, but like the location of the New Jerusalem, may ha happen elsewhere. <clears throat> now I'm going to reread that sentence again. I just think all of these ideas really only settled on me and Sarah because we've, we've been through them over and over again, and, and the first pass through, they don't necessarily sink in. These servants, all of those who came before and who then thereafter show up, to help dispense the new dispensation of the gospel. These servants obtained rights and honors and are expected to come to the great future meeting when Adam and Diamond occurs, that event, again in the last days. At that meeting, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I thought I would just cut in, in case it's it's new to some some people, Adam and Diamond, this meeting that, that occurred um, in our TNC 154, we we learn about that three years previous to the death of Adam. Adam called Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, er, Enoch, and Methuselah, Methuselah, sorry, who were all high priests, and calls them into a valley that we call Adam on Diamond, and he there bestows upon him a blessing. The Lord appears and um, calls up Michael, calls him Prince, the Archangel, and. Many things happen, including that Adam, who's been on the earth for 927 years or so, um, is bowed down with age, but prophesies the things that will happen concerning his posterity till the end of um, the earth. So in, in case that was not something that some people on the call knew, that was the first meeting of Adam on Diamond. And what we're reading in this footnote here is that that's not just a place, that's an event. So that event that type of an event is going to happen again um, in the future. And that same priesthood, which was in the beginning, will be in the end of time. And the same event, it seems, with a different 
purpose will occur uh, in the end of time. At the end of this paragraph uh, that we're reading, <clears throat> at that meeting, an accounting will be given in the presence of Christ to Father Adam. An accounting, to restate this, an accounting is going to be given to Father Adam in the presence of Christ, who will be at the meeting. Preliminary to Christ's return as the one whose right it is to preside over all things. <clears throat> if a dispensation was given and the recipient failed to complete the work God assigned, then he acquires no key, no honor, no right, no authority from the Lord, and therefore has nothing to account for to Adam. So I want to summarize and hopefully put this fairly, <clears throat> some of what we just had presented to us and differentiate it once more, um, especially for someone who maybe is new to these ideas, a difference in our understanding of how things were in the LDS institutional mindset from which we came and the way that it's being presented here. The challenge from the mission statement, paragraph one of this talk is to understand priesthood. The challenge is to understand the holy order, the work of the gods here upon the earth and how they dispense the gospel on the earth. In, in order to tee up this long conversation, I think, by the way, the transcript for this talk was like 19 pages after it was given. The paper that we're reading from is like 46 pages. That, so that's a good hint that we've got. You know, if we only listen to it, maybe we ought to go study the paper. But the purpose or the, of this whole effort here is in this series of talks to understand priesthood. And so right up front, to tee up the conversation, we discuss keys, dispensations, and this meeting. The event took place at the beginning of the world, at the end of the first generation, when Adam is about to pass away, and it's going to happen again in our lifetimes, or in this generation, I should say, should say mm -hmm. at the end of the world. The... It's my view, and I think it's the view presented in this paper, that it is not possible to properly understand priesthood absent what is shared in these couple of pages about keys and dispensations of the gospel and in whom they are invested and this meeting or these meetings, this event. Christ the King has the right to preside over this creation, Adam, Father Adam, is given keys for this cycle of creation and the government of God that's ever established, whenever it has been established, is done through this order, through this, pre this is the priesthood. This is the relationship that exists between those who have, those who become God's ministering mortal angels on the earth and the gods in heaven. This is how it's accomplished. And it's in those keys that will allow for an invitation to come back to Adam on Diamond. And so to contrast that with the church understanding, it is not the teacher's quorum president. It is not the bishop. It is not the stake president or any of the apostles, so-called, that possess or run around with keys that they brag about or that allow them to control others, that gets them an invitation to come back to Adam on Diamond. It's not that at all. It's in fact, Adam and 10 God Kings, I have to put it that in one that says the priest, the high priest of the earth uh, before the flood and those who have come on the spine and perhaps some others elsewhere after the flood to Joseph and Hiram into our own day. If they've had the gospel dispensed to them, I I'm, I'm not, trying to be overly redundant to be a pain or pedantic, but I want to drive home this point. Those are God's high priests that are, are asked to give an accounting at this meeting. I don't know for sure, but I could guess that in like manner with the first event, it wasn't just the high priest, but there was a righteous residue that was present as well at that meeting. Is that something that will take place at the end? I don't know. Uh, but if, if there's a perfect mirror, then you could expect that some righteous unnamed residue could get to participate in the meeting as well. But the key holders, so to speak, did something, died with that something, and retained the rights forever. 
until they meet at that meeting and choose of their own volition, of their own free will, to surrender that to Father Adam, who gives his accounting up to Christ. Uh, which, incidentally, we won't get into it tonight, is also directly tied to the reason why the untrust, untrusted, cursed bloodline of Cain was cursed as pertaining to, this is the important phrase, the right of priesthood. That's the phrase. That's what's in Abraham. We're talking, you can only understand that statement by understanding what we're talking about tonight. Uh, this is the beginning of understanding all of that. It has nothing to do with who gets the priesthood in the church. Aaronic priesthood, Melchizedek priesthood, a bunch of ordinations. It has nothing to do with that. It has, it has to do with the fact that at the end of the world, God, men in whom God himself has placed trust and confidence and in whom he has placed faith, need to, of their own volition, surrender the keys. Okay, so I want to make that point. We've got two paragraphs left in this in this, uh, in this paper, on this page, and then um, I guess we're about 40 minutes in, so maybe we'll have time for just a couple of that questions. Uh, I'll finish out here. All who are invited... Um, yeah, right in the middle of the page. All who are invited to the future meeting when Adam and I Amen occurs again will give an account of their labor. This means it is necessary for servants to perform what God assigns to them in strict conformity to the assignment to honor and serve God. The notion that someone can obtain keys without receiving a dispensation from the Lord and successfully completing the work of God is an idea that should be rejected. Okay, so there's the definitive, what I would say is kind of the conclusion of the matter, although we're going to we're going to mention keys again in the next paragraph and the dis and dispensations. That's the end all be all. He's, he's wrapped this up here in two pages. Abandon that notion altogether. You're under abolish whatever you thought you understood of keys and readjust or reassert your paradigm in this way. When God dispenses the gospel on the earth, there's authority that's given implicit in the assignment. And when that assignment is faithfully conducted or that obligation faithfully discharged, the keys are retained forever. And there's a meeting that will take place that will get all that sorted out later. But that's the only way God could conduct, it seems, conduct business in this, in any, in this cycle of creation was to allow for the trust to exist between him on the one hand and a mortal servant on the other in whom is vested that power and authority to accomplish something that God himself needs to bring about, but can't in this dark world. The mortal servant does it, and he's so trusted, in fact, that he has keys given to him. If he's faithful, he keeps them and gets to give an accounting of that later. If he's not faithful, he doesn't. And the prime example of that is Cain, who was had an opportunity to be the birthright um, son and, and hold that priesthood, but was not faithful, um, offered a sacrifice that wasn't pleasing to God, then committed murder. And so he does not, he had something dispensed to him, I mm -hmm. presume, but he does not hold those keys because he didn't stay faithful and carry them in. Yeah. The next world. Did I say that right? Yeah, I think so. And uh, again, drawing upon section 140, the hint to me that in fact, he had something dispensed to him to use that language is this. And it's that, uh, I don't remember what verse it's in. Scriptures are sitting here. Um, it, Joseph teaches that Cain had been authorized to offer sacrifice, as if it required authorization in the first place, but that having been authorized and not being faithful to the Lord of heaven, but obeying a different master, he lost that right that belonged to him, and, and Abel secures it. Okay, last paragraph here. We're down to the home stretch. You've gotten through, uh, let's see, two out of 40 say, we're like a 20th of the way through the talk. We're well on our way to preparing for the conference. To be clear, for the foregoing reasons, and because many Mormons misunderstand and misapply the word keys to mean authority to control and direct, I avoid using the term. Many people believe that one dispensation must resemble another. There are those there are those who are critical or ignorant of what God is doing now because it is different from what Joseph Smith did. 
There have been only two successful models since the fall of man. The scriptures disclose little about Enoch and Melchizedek's dispensations. But there is enough to know they did not establish a hierarchical institution with inequality between people. The work of God today will be done as he alone directs. It is apparent from what his, has already taken place that God intends to accomplish many things that Joseph Smith only hinted at and never had the opportunity to accomplish. Uh, great evidence for the idea that not all dispensations look alike is in the section that Sarah has already quoted from. It's section 154 of Teachings and Commandments, which is uh, just an excellent instruction for us. It's a compilation of italicized text that comes from Mike Hamill. Um, and my understanding is it might be incorrect, but uh, in conversation or dialogue with Denver, <laughs> I guess I'm correct. It says it in the uh, section heading in consultation with Denver Snuffer. And then some older language that we were familiar with from section 107 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And um, it really gets to the heart of the matter and it's excellent. I'll yeah. mention as a one other thought. Yeah, can um, I just read that real real quick? I, I think yeah. that's a really beautiful teaching and it was a new idea for us. Um, when there are those who are critical or ignorant of what God is doing because it looks different from what Joseph did. This section 154, I just want to read you the first verse and it's worth noting that you should go back and read section 154 on your own time. When God delivers a dispensation of the gospel to the earth, the head of that dispensation is granted the right and privilege of organizing the dispensation. As the head organizes the dispensation according to righteous principles and gets God's approval, um, then that dispensation is established and remains effective until apostasy necessitates another restoration. And so you learn that Adam organized his dispensation a certain way and that Abraham organized it a certain way. And when Christ came, he organized his dispensation a certain way. And so did Joseph. And they don't all look exactly the same, but that's their prerogative as a dispensation head to organize um, according to righteous principles and with the um, acceptance of God. I think that's a really beautiful teaching and it's, it's new to us in this day. And so worth pointing out. Yeah. And closing on my part throw out here real quick if I can, if that's all right. Sure. Given the definitions of successful dispensations that you've discussed tonight, uh, what do you make of Joseph Smith's dispensation? Would you say it was successful or not successful? Here's my answer to that question. Uh, and now I will open the scriptures um, to, to go back to section 140. And I want to draw upon the, the example of Abel first and then point to some things that the Lord has said about Joseph. But Go to if you go to section 140, I'll tell you what verse we'll read from. Paragraph. I know some of you corrected me in your mind and said paragraphs. I say verse still. I still say verse, but they're really big verses. Okay, I am on page 366, 367. We're going to be in paragraph eight. Uh, might as well go to paragraph six, because the longer we take to answer one question, the fewer questions we can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, he set the ordinances to be the same forever and ever and set Adam to watch over them, all because whether it's directly related or not, uh, it provides us good context for what's coming in paragraph nine, which is what I really want to get to. Um, and because it's related to the topic we've been talking about tonight to reveal them from heaven to man or to or to send angels to reveal them see hebrews 1 2 are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation these angels are under the direction of michael or adam who acts under the direction of christ from the above quotation we learn that paul perfectly understood the purpose of god in relation to his connection by the way i have to point out because it was it was evident to me after just i i went through this section a couple of times uh, in in the last week and this is an investigation into the priesthood that's what joseph called this and he dictates it to robert b thompson october 1840 and his investigation of the priesthood consists of him going back to the beginning with adam talking about keys and talking through dispensation heads. 
Denver follows a similar model, but does a far more expansive look at all of this. And, and, and so I think it's really great to see that the, the pattern of thought to, to use, to put it that way, was the same for people who understood this topic. Joseph understood it very well. Uh, he received all of this information. He had visits from these angels uh, who, who declared their keys and their ministries and whatnot and their honors and their powers. And I, I, he received it. I think he understood it. And whether or not he was able to properly convey all of that articulately to the 2024 hearer, um, is a different question altogether, but we're getting uh, a clearer uh, mode of, of communication in, in our own day than we had available to us in this. All right, let me let me just jump ahead so this doesn't come become too lengthy. In, in, in paragraph eight, in the beginning, God called Adam by his own voice. See Genesis two seventeen, and the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. Adam received commandments and instruction from God. This was the order from the beginning. It's always been the order. And I'm going to read one more quote about it in a moment. That he received revelations, commandments, and ordinances at the beginning is beyond the power of controversy. I'm going to make the parallel now early and often to Joseph because the question was about Joseph. Did Joseph, like Adam and like the other dispensation heads, receive revelations, commandments, and ordinances when the gospel was dispensed to him? And the answer is uh, in, invariably, yes, the man was always in communication with the heavens. He was a faithful, apparently far more virtuous servant than we had imagined in the past decade. And he receives like all of the others who had the gospel dis dispensed to them, these, these uh, or ordinances, um, revelations, power, etc. And I'll come to this in just a, a moment. Oh yeah, well that's a good that's a good tie. And Sarah's pointing me to the fact that uh, in the teachings and commandments we see also Joseph's written witness that he had the voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light, and the voice of Peter and James and John. What's the purpose of that? And other various diverse angels, the voice of Gabriel and of Raphael and of diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time, all declaring their dispensations, their rights, their keys, their honors. Now, the question is whether or not Joseph established Zion and whether or not that was his calling, did he go to the great faithful? Uh, and, and I'm getting to that point here in uh, paragraph nine uh, in just a moment. I'm halfway through paragraph eight. Adam received commandments and instruction from God. This was the order from the beginning, that he received revelations, commandments, and ordinances at the beginning, is beyond the power of controversy, else how did they begin to offer sacrifices to God in an acceptable manner? And if they offered sacrifices, they must be authorized by ordination. Cain was authorized. He, he teaches that in this section, by the way. We read in Genesis 3-7, and this now we're getting to the heart of the matter, that Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering. And again, Hebrews 1.37, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. How does he yet speak? Why, he magnified the priesthood which was conferred upon him, and died a righteous man, and therefore has become an angel of God by receiving his body from the dead, therefore holding still the keys of his dispensation, and was sent down from heaven unto Paul to minister consoling words, etc. So it's my contention that not only do we have abundant evidence that Joseph, like all of the previous dispensation heads, had had all of these dispensation heads come to him declaring their rights and their keys and their ministries and so forth, that he was faithful in the discharge of his duties while he remained on the earth before through a conspire through, through a conspiracy uh, he and his brother are murdered not only that we have evidence in our day um, and I'll, I'll stop with this thought that he was a part of showing up to our current dispensation head uh, and has been very much involved in a part of the ongoing restoration and i have to ask the question uh, denver's of course vouched for him year after year after year into his faithfulness which uh, almost says enough. 
But the fact is, not only did he receive those visitations and faithfully uh, comply with the instructions he was given in his lifetime, it seems that the Lord is serious about defending Joseph and what we have from the Lord in Revelations. Denver's been serious about defending him, and he's he's visited with them, which seems like a necessary part of the dispensing of any gospel. And, and would he be a part of that dispensing if he had been unfaithful or didn't retain the keys? And so that's my thought on on Joseph. Okay. All right, I agree. Uh, Cameron, any other questions? Uh, we're, we're coming up on an hour here. Yeah, we've got several questions here. You all right if I throw some at you? Sure. If, if McKay is okay with that. Well, McKay, you want to throw the questions out? I don't even want to go into the chat because we've got 54 on red messages. So I'm letting you look at all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Go yeah. ahead, That's Cameron. Uh, okay, here's a question. Uh, somebody asks, uh, what, well, what, the temporal relationship between Adam on Diamond and the second coming. Yeah. Do you have any comments? I can't tell, I can't say how many hours or days or weeks or months or years might uh, pass in between the two, but it seems to me, it seems to us that there is an immediate temporal relation between that event taking place and the delivering up of a report to Father Adam in the presence of Son Amun and the, the impending second coming of our Lord. Uh, and, and in this talk, in these two pages that we read, one of the things that is mentioned, and perhaps that question may have been asked before we read this part, but at that meeting, Denver says, and, and this is, by the way, on page two in the second big paragraph there, towards the bottom, about four lines up. At that meeting, an accounting will be given in the presence of Christ to Father Adam, preliminary to Christ's return as the one whose right it is to preside over all things. So as definitively as I'm willing to say it, it's preliminary to Christ's return in glory. And yet it's taking place in the presence of Christ. And the Yeah, Christ is there. I mean, Christ is coming. Think on that. And it's the many, it's, I mean, the, it's like the day of the Lord is beginning, if it hasn't already begun, but um, his, his, his glorious return, it seems, this is all preliminary to that. And it seems it's necessary part of the authorized invitation to the Lord for him to return and take um, back ownership uh and, and and to reign as the king yeah what mortals need to be there at that meeting in your opinion or your understanding well my my present belief is that this is just my view so that there's only one mortal at the moment that is required to be at that meeting that's my view if some of the rest of us believing souls get to get to somehow witness that from the bleachers that they drag in. Uh, and then that's great. But I, it seems to me that it seems to me that in our day, there's one living dispensation head that possesses the work, uh, possesses the authority to do the work or the labor. And I might be, um, you know, I know there's holy men we know not of, and uh, I know there's prophets and peoples that will come. It'll be really interesting to see how that's all fulfilled. But when you say one person or one man, do you view uh, the, the okay. couple, marriage <laughs> couple? Oh, that, well, that, that's one, a great point. Or do, do you refer just to one man, literally? I don't. I don't know. But it, uh, if this, you know, our, our view on the holy order is, has always been this idea of the man and the woman, the divine man and the woman. And so, one of the things that's absent from our record of the first event called Adam on Dayaman is um, is whether or not there were women present. It wouldn't surprise me one bit if there were. If it's Adam and point. Eve, if it's Seth and his wife, mm -hmm. if it's Enos and his wife. But yeah, it does say true. that it, that they're gathered with those high priests are the residue of their posterity who are righteous. So Matt noted this earlier, but if, if the future Adam on Diamond meeting mirrors the first, then perhaps there will also be a residue of righteous people there. Right. Uh, is there anything that is needed that needs to happen or is needed to happen at Adam on Diamond other than the transfer of keys that we've been discussing? Not that we've covered tonight, uh, as far as I know. Um, what do you think? I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, maybe we could guess at that stuff, but um, it's sure fun to speculate, but I, I don't know. Yeah, if you'd like to hear my speculative thoughts once we're done recording this, then. Uh, but no, yeah, I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I would say there's some thoughts that come to my mind that I'd like to. Uh, now, th this is not a direct answer to that question, but I, I need to make sure I say it. There are several sections of the teachings and commandments that we would point you to. In order to, if you're interested in still going into, well, it's not just about the first two pages. It's this entire Holy Order talk that I think is useful, additional, supplementary material. And um, I'll just share those here. It's, uh, it's section 139 and section 140. We've already quoted from section 140. That's the investigation to the priesthood. Uh, section 139 is another one that, that uh, in fact, I think that's the, Liber the Liberty Jail letter. Um, we've quoted from that tonight as well. Section 151 is another one that would be good. And section 154, all of those have um, relevant information about the priesthood that is worth reviewing. And of course, Denver's first talk on priesthood. Uh, somebody asked, yeah, somebody asked a question here. Um, I don't suppose anyone really knows what's meant by people retaining the keys of our assignments here on Earth forever, or do some of you really understand what that means on a deep level? And if so, can you explain this? It's a great question. Um, I'll, in all honesty, Sarah and I understand it at about the level that we explained tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, the reason I like the question is because um, it was unnatural for me to change my view that I'd had for so many years, for a couple of decades about keys and how they're received and, and transferred and delegated to this view of not even having them until the work has been faithfully completed. The idea that you can leave this world without them uh, but that if you left the world, you get to keep them. And it's like, well, what good do they do you if you left the world? And I, and I think here's a part, and I just want to reiterate a part uh, of what we've already covered, because I think it has a key to understanding this topic. It's at the very top of page two, when Denver says the greatest key to unlock truth is pure knowledge. And then, then in the next paragraph, Denver teaches that all of the dispensations when, when someone receives a dispensation, that's not it. A new dispensation is founded on knowledge from those who went before, etc., and so forth. And so what does that really mean to retain? I think the question isn't, you know, does someone here know the answer and can you explain it? Although that would be nice, uh, but probably for, 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 for um, simplicity's sake, I think it's worth really trying to understand the idea of keys and and their relationship to to knowledge, the kind of knowledge that elevates out of this world and stretches to the utmost heavens and contemplates the darkest abyss and and being allowed to retain that forever and then how that makes you a useful servant in the future cycles and ongoing iterations of the Lord's work to redeem souls. I think that's probably where the mystery lies. That right. Yeah. So I've got uh, uh, one more in chat. I, I know we're a few minutes over. If I can ask one more in chat and then maybe if you'll indulge me and allow me to ask one question that I've got for me, uh, I don't know what your time looks like. Is that, is that acceptable if we do that? That's good with us. Yeah. Okay. Here's the question from chat. Um, he says, my understanding of priesthood has been completely destroyed. My question is, what do I need to focus on and take away? He quotes, he received revelations, commandments. Receiving commandments seems to be from God. Should that be my focus to get? Do you mind if I take yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, here's how I'd like to share a thought on that. Um, it's not probably what this person thought they were looking for. Um, but, but I, I like this idea. And so I thought I'd share it. Um, be, because 
in fellowship meetings and in conversations with believers all around. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the people I've been looking at all night here is, um, I shouldn't call him out, but Dustin, thanks for listening so well. <laughs> You know, you've been really attentive and everyone has their cameras turned off and I'm I'm sitting here like having a conversation with Dustin all night. So this has been really nice um, because Dustin and I spent some time together recently and, and had good talks. And um, I, I just want to, you know, this this idea came up and it keeps kind of recurring. And, and so whether the topic is priesthood or it's some other topic. I've heard it said a number of different ways, but it's something like, I know nothing anymore. Or um, I don't know what to believe anymore. Part of that's wrapped up not just in having our gospel paradigm replaced, but also in confusion in the political arena and social arena and culturally and YouTube and uh, to use to borrow Denver's phrase from a long time ago, your minds are so gunked up with the crap of the internet that you don't know, you know what to believe. And um, I want to kind of, and, and I can, I can empathize with the sentiment, although I do want to confront it just momentarily because, um, we've been so well instructed that even though it might feel like to use again, a phrase from Denver's passing the heavenly gift, perhaps the truth will scratch your eyes out, but it should provide for you a new lens through which to see and, and properly process information. That's what a new paradigm does. It should answer a lot of the outstanding questions that should have been already lingering. If you didn't know you had those questions before with your previous worldview or paradigm, then Denver's done a great job digging some of those questions up for years and years as well for us so that we start to question the existing fabric of our worldview. But my point is, and, and this is really important, not only, I think, is it important for us to acknowledge that we are not ignorant, but that we that it's a kind of sign of gratitude to acknowledge that even though our old views have been abolished, we, we, we have this opportunity to have a far more profound understanding of the fullness of the gospel than has ever been available to us before. And I'm going to paint a picture for you, and it's this. It's a geometry picture, but if you can picture a circle, you'll follow. Uh, a sphere, let's say. If you're a flat earther, I got nothing for you. You probably won't be able to follow this uh, picture, but um, a sphere has an has a certain volume. And let's say, um, well, you can even picture a circle. So flat earthers are okay still. You picture a circle, it's got a certain area. As the area of your understanding increases, okay, follow me so far, so too does the perimeter of your ignorance as the area of your understanding increases, so too does the perimeter of your ignorance. Well, what does that mean? It means that the more you've been taught, the more that funnels through your soul, the more touch points with the unknown you encounter, the more questions you begin to experience. That is not bad. It's actually quite good and healthy. But what becomes unhealthy is that we start to despair because we have to start confronting all of those touch points with the unknown. And one thing that I find really helpful is to is to always revisit and remember what it is that we've been presented. Try and deeply drink from those waters to understand it and root ourselves in it. And when that tree blossoms and we have all of these touch points with the unknown, the more we can continue to understand, the, then the more questions we're going to have. And it's not that you're unlearning. It's not that everything is being abolished all over again, although it can be termed that way. And I know this is maybe, again, a little bit philosophical, but I really like this image of, of touch points with the unknown. We, we understand more than we've ever understood before, including on the priesthood. And tonight, what we've talked about alone is more than we've been able to ever appreciate, if it's understood, about the priesthood in all of our life. I love Bruce McConkie. I, I, I read a lot of Bruce McConkie. He was one of the best scriptorians we had in, in the Latter-day Saint church, despite problems in understanding with doctrine or whatnot. You could, you could digest that your entire life, and you can abolish all of it with two pages and a talk tonight and come away with a much more profound understanding of priesthood that a nonprofit could never give you. And so I think what I'm trying to get at there is I'm not trying to poke uh, or jab at the person who says my understanding of priesthood has been abolished. I can empathize with that. Ask yourself what it is we think we do know. That's not a 
problem for me to solve for you or for us to answer for you. It's like, what do I genuinely know? And, and add that to a foundation of knowledge and belief that can be built upon, you can exercise faith in, and then see if it bears good fruit. And when it does, and this stuff always does, um, see how that blossoms and see, see, see the ways in which the Lord is able to present new ideas uh, to your mind. Um, I think it's healthy for us to have that. It's not a faith crisis. Have those contradictions and uncertainties and questions at, with every topic we will confront as we have the gospel represented to us, not redefining terms, but presented under the umbrella of an entirely new paradigm. Your old fabric is being removed. Um, and so we don't need to try and stitch up our old understanding. The cloak has been removed. It can be essentially set aside and we have a new cloak to put on. And so work within it and see if it bears fruit. I hope that's not too much, but I, I hear that a lot. And um, I, I sense more questions in my heart and mind than I've ever had. And I also sense that we, we have a profound gift. Um, someone asked me for book recommendations the other day. I gave them a few. And I thought I'd be guilty if I didn't say our Restoration Edition scriptures are more profound than all of them. And because it's it's really true. As we continue to grow and develop, we go back to these things, and we realize just how great a gift it is that that we've got. Thanks for that. Uh, you have uh, one more question, one more answer in you. Yeah, sure. All right. In uh, on this page two, in the second paragraph, talking about when God gives man a dispensation, uh, the first little bit has a footnote that references, um. But note number six, the reason ministers returned to visit Joseph was because they acquired the keys after successfully completing the assignment God gave them. Joseph needed this endowment to lay the foundation for a new dispensation. And I found, as I was studying this, that terminology to be really interesting, the idea of an endowment, the idea of uh, a connection there, the knowledge aspect of it to a dispensation and and all of this, which... I think you covered a little bit. So here's the question I've got for you. Did Joseph, in your view, intend through the temple endowment to give others the ability to lay their own foundations? And if so, are you expecting some future pattern to follow in that same scenario in the future? There's a number of different ways to, to approach that. I think it, that's a camera question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I warned you. I, I warned you, man. Here's here's what I'd like to turn to is um, in our introduction of the teachings and commandments. Um, there's a statement that comes from the Covenant Conference in Boise that I think is worth reading. And um, yeah, well, let's just turn there and then I'll share my thought about it. It's um. It's in the introduction portion of teachings and commandments. And there's no page numbers. And so if you go to the last full page on the right side of your scriptures, um, there's a quote in there from that conference. It looks like this. Okay, and that's, that's what I'm going to read from. God alone will establish Zion. It might seem at first as if this is not related, but there's a point to it. His instructions are vital and necessary for us. Once he instructs us, the scriptures can then be used to confirm that his direction to us now is consistent with what he has prophesied, covenanted, and promised would happen. But the path to Zion is to be found only by following God's immediate commands to us. That is how he will that is how he will bring it. He will lead us there. And we do have a leader after all. There is no magic, there is no sprinkling fairy dust that will take you to where God is. It does not and cannot happen that way. He will lead us, teach us, command us, guide us, but we have to be the ones who become what he commands. I am keeping your question in mind about Joseph and what he was trying to accomplish. 
with an endowment, by the way, and I, I think I understand the question. We have to be the ones, we have to be the ones who do what he bids us do. That's true for a dispensation head as much as it is um, uh, those to whom they minister and provide instructions and, and ordinances and so forth. Then Denver or whoever put this together continues. The, the Lord explained in plainness what his purpose is for, a restor for the restoration. This explanation was given to Joseph Smith as an introduction to the first printed collection of the Lord's revelations in the Book of Commandments. Wherefore, I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph and spoke unto him from heaven and gave him commandments, part of the, the dispensing of the gospel, and also gave commandments to others that they should proclaim these things unto the world. And all this, that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets, the weak things of the world should come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. That man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh, but that every man might speak in the name of God. And I think if any, if I could really, something I really believe is intended to be accomplished through the endowment of power. Remember, there's three things. David Christensen made that really nice video a long time ago with those short vignettes from Denver. And there was that one video that stands out and it was towards the end of the series. And, and Denver said, there needs to be a temple completed. The fullness of the priesthood must be restored and the new Jerusalem must be built. And that order I think is important. Uh, you're not going to establish the New Jerusalem without the fullness of the priesthood. You're not going to get the fullness of the priesthood without a temple being accepted by the Lord. And you'll never have a people that are able to do that unless the Lord provides a way through instruction and commandment and by leading us so that at some point every man might speak in the name of the, uh, in the name of God, the Lord, even the Savior of the world, that faith also might increase in the earth that my everlasting covenant might be established, that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed, same one Abraham had, same one that Adam and the patriarchs had, it might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple. Um, I, lo I love the idea, by the way, of instead of saying you're great, saying you're weak. If you want to participate in the fulfillment of prophecy, be one of the weak and simple. Uh, if you want to be one of the strong and powerful, then you'll be torn down and trodden underfoot by the weak and the simple. And the si weak and the simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. Behold, I am God and have spoken it. And then I love this. You are invited to read and study the sacred volume of scripture that you may one day, this feels like the end of the endowment or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like the same kind of an invitation and, and approach that you may one day be able to speak in the name of God, that your faith might increase, that you may join in the everlasting covenant. It's like you've been grafted in. Now, don't wither and die. Don't dry up. Assimilate into the tree with the first fathers by following the lead of the master by receiving instruction by waiting for further instruction i'm waiting on commandments from my father and we know how those will come and when you receive it you approach that path humbly as one of the weak and simple striving to increase in faith that you may join the everlasting covenant bear fruit as a graft meet him yourself that's when the real fruit is, it returns Proclaim the fullness of his gospel and assist in the establishment of Zion. It seems to me that whatever Joseph was trying to do, and this is kind of my way of answering the thought to the question, whatever he was hoping to accomplish, I can't, I can't quite say, and I'm fairly familiar with that period in the endowment and, and what was accomplished while he was alive and then what was presented in Nauvoo before the saints come west. I think it's at least true to say that the Lord's aim is that he have a community of equal people who have become equally accountable before him, who, come, who can come in faith to speak in the name of God, the Lord of the world, and who, through their humility and obedience, can 
um, can be invited into a temple and can uh, participate in the preaching of the gospel and the establishment of Zion. And if that's done, then the whole earth won't be utterly wasted. It is coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for um, letting us join everybody. And we're really looking forward to um, the future conversations. And uh, we've only read two pages of this talk so <laughs> far. So we're, we're really looking forward to getting to the rest of it. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a cue. Um, thank you, Matt. And thank you, Sarah, for your teaching and instruction. Uh, next week, we're going to be uh, talking about the Holy Order, which is about the next seven pages uh, of the talk. Uh, Alan Van Leer and possibly his wife. I can't remember what she said on that invitation, but Alan is going to lead us in a discussion about just what is the Holy Order and what it isn't, and those seven pages of material. We ended up uh, maxing out at 100 participants before right at about seven o'clock, and so unfortunately a lot of people could not join us tonight that wanted to. We'll uh, remedy that for next week. And we'll have a 500 person limit on our Zoom account, right, Cameron? Give me a nod. Yeah, uh, I'll just jump in here and I'll offer my own apologies on that. We didn't really know what to expect coming into this, kind of set it up and, and acted the best that we could. We uh, made some decisions to allow video to be displayed so that people could see each other's faces. And um, But we had all the mics, microphones muted uh, this week. Next week, we'll do it as a similar style with no microphones, uh, except uh, by invitation. And uh, we'll have it expanded to a 500-seat capacity, but we uh, will not be doing video for everybody to, to make sure that there aren't problems with the amount of traffic that way. I expect that it'll be the same link next week, but if it's not and that needs to be updated, then that'll be updated on the web page for the Spring Eclipse Conference that uh, that has this, which is also where I expect this recording will be posted. Okay, very good. Um, I have asked uh, Lark Sir if she could offer a closing prayer. Um, can you unmute uh, Lark's mic, please? I just sent an invitation to Lark to unmute herself or okay, himself. She just did. Yeah. Go ahead, Lark. Okay, thank you. Our beloved Father who art in heaven, we are deeply grateful for this opportunity to unite together as brothers and sisters in Christ who have a profound interest and love in the gospel, the salvation of, of Christ. It is gratifying to know others who are like-minded in our desire for repentance, forgiveness, to grow in the gospel, to obtain knowledge. We are so appreciative of those who have established this class for the next few weeks and the privilege it is to share our testimonies our questions, our concerns, without ridicule, with acceptance, with a loving heart. We all are struggling in our own way, and we need the power of the Holy Ghost to guide us and to confirm to us truth and rightness. There are many who are struggling in their personal lives with temptation, pitfalls, personal adversities. We pray for their ability to return to the fold to re receive answers to their problems and their questions and that they will feel the love from this united group. I pray a blessing to be with all those individuals who have been on here tonight and those who could not get on, that they will be encouraged to continue to study and pray and find truth for themselves. We especially appreciate the Low Myers for their um, great preparation and their strength of 
testimony and their knowledge. We pray for everyone's families in this effort and in this movement that we will support the work of the Lord and his servant. And we express our love to thee this night humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.